with us tonight here at the Centre for Jewish Life is uh, Jack Kagan, who will uh, fill you with a uh, with an amazing um, history of his life and the story of great courage in the face of um, amazing and extraordinary adversity that hopefully we will never experience in our lives, or indeed ever again as, as a people. Um, Jack Kagan's story of extreme survival is as harrowing as it is inspirational. Um, I've had the pleasure of sitting down with Jack for about the first half hour, and I'm absolutely bowled over by, um, by what he's told me. So I certainly hope that um, um, you'll find it inspirational and moving as well. Um, it's essentially the story of a 14-year-old boy who, together with a band of Jews in Nazi-occupied Belarus, survived the Holocaust, and he lives to tell the tale uh, today. Um, Jack, first of all, welcome to the Centre for Jewish Life. Thank you. Um, nice to be here. Tell me, where did you grow up and how did you grow up? I was born in a place called Novogrudek. Novogrudek is uh, Navaredok to say Jewish people. It's called a new town, but actually it wasn't a new town. The town was over a thousand years old and the Jews lived there for 500 years. And it was a Jewish town and a place of learning for the Jews. It was a Musa community, contrary to the Hasidic. They had a very nice yeshiva, which was a Musa yeshiva. Um, it was a place where it was nice to live and nice to learn. And the biggest commodity, which was a life to the Navarit girl, was to study. Life, the population was 12,000 people, 6,000 Jews among them. We lived very comfortable in the early years, and of course, 1881, that was, the Tsar was assassinated, and immigration started from my town. And they were extremely lucky that from our town, the rich people went to America first. And as soon as they reached New York, they purchased a house to be the Navaret Kershul. And as soon as this has happened, the Navaret Kershul started to emigrate to America. And by the First World War, we had 4,500 Jews living in Novogrudek and 4,500 Navaretka Jews living in, uh, in New York. Of course, the First World War was a terrible place for Novogrudek because it was occupied by the Germans, which was a different kind of Germans, but it was a front line. 21, it was very big problems because civil war from 1918 to 21, which was the Bolsheviks, the Mensheviks, the Poles, and eventually in 1921 it became the Polish Republic. So we had a stability from 1921 till 35. In 35, Pilsudski, which was a marshal then of Poland, he died, and Rich Migli, with the remainder, took over. And of course, with them was anti-Semitism in my state. So anti-Semitism was they should. So anti-Semitism was the Jews should leave the place, but from 1921 the borders were closed, you couldn't go anywhere, and we were trapped. And so you were born into a country in 1929 where the borders were, you were trapped. We were trapped completely. Yeah, at was, birth, from birth. From birth. There was nowhere to go. America didn't let you in. England, of course, didn't let you in. Palestine, the doors were closed. You needed special permission. But we had a lot of kibbutzim. We, we were an organized community. We were organized only because of the help of the American money. As you can understand, that in 1931, we've received $40,000 from the American Jews living in, uh, in New York. And $40,000 at that time was a fortune. And of course, things went from bad to worse. And in August 1939, it was a Ribbentrop-Molotov agreement, and we knew that war is imminent. And the war broke out on the 1st of September 1939. The Soviets came in on the 17th of September 1939. And with that, the community life in Novogrudek has stopped to function because they didn't kill anybody, but arrests was on a daily occurrence 
for Zionists, for rich people, for people who spoke Hebrew. The Hebrew language, which I was brought up in a school where it says, Ata Ivri, Daber Ivrit. And suddenly the Hebrew school had to be closed. The shuls, which we had, somebody asked me a question how many synagogues we had in our town. Uh, it was, would be very difficult to count because every trade had a synagogue. It was like a club on Saturday. The shoemakers went to the shoemaker synagogue, the butchers went to their synagogue, small business people, and so on and so on. All this has stopped. What they had, uh, let's say, a Maccabi sport club. You can't have a Maccabi sport club under the Soviet Union. They had an orphanage. You can't have a Jewish orphanage. You must have a mixed orphanage. All the businesses had to stop. Of course, unemployment immediately has risen because the Jews were the ones who produced the goods in Novogrudek. But we didn't know that worse can to come. And of course, the 22nd of June, 1941, the German war with Russia. The town was bombed, it was burned, and the trouble started. At that point, was that uh, the point where the Jews that were left were enslaved in camps? No, it was a pause, as to say. They came into our place on the 4th of July, 41. At the beginning, it was that every Jew must start wearing yellow stars front and back. A Jew mustn't walk on the pavement. But the worst law of all was you lose your citizenship right. And that means that if somebody who hates you or doesn't hate you wants to kick you or wants to go in into your house and to take away your furniture, you can't complain because you have no right. You can't go to the police station and say, look, he kicked me for nothing. You have no right. You can't complain to anybody. And that started more and more. We had to work for the Germans clearing up the bomb town. Food was getting very difficult, and people who had trades, like my father was a saddle maker, he had to work for the Germans, for, again, for very little trade, but things started to go worse. And that happened from July, from the 4th of July when they came in, to the 5th of December, 1941. 